Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. I am leaving soon, and you will forgive me if I speak bluntly. The universe grows smaller every day, and the threat of aggression by any group, anywhere, can no longer be tolerated. There must be security for all, or no one is secure. Now, this does not mean giving up any freedom, except the freedom to act irresponsibly. Your ancestors knew this when they made laws to govern themselves and hired policemen to enforce them. We of the other planets have long accepted this principle. We have an organization for the mutual protection of all planets and for the complete elimination of aggression. The test of any such higher authority is, of course, the police force that supports it. For our policemen, we created a race of robots. Their function is to patrol the planets in spaceships like this one and preserve the peace. In matters of aggression, we have given them absolute power over us. This power cannot be revoked. At the first sign of violence, they act automatically against the aggressor. The penalty for provoking their action is too terrible to risk. The result is, we live in peace, without arms or armies, secure in the knowledge that we are free from aggression and war, free to pursue more profitable enterprises. Now, we do not pretend to have achieved perfection, but we do have a system, and it works. I came here to give you these facts. It is no concern of ours how you run your own planet. But if you threaten to extend your violence, this earth of yours will be reduced to a burned-out cinder. Your choice is simple. Join us and live in peace, or pursue your present course and face obliteration. We shall be waiting for your answer. The decision rests with you. Plato's speech from the day the Earth stood still, 1951. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… The death of a Hollywood movie producer is still unsolved, and his spirit on the lot is still at unrest. A family moves into a new home, and it's not long before they begin hearing strange sounds coming from the home bar in their living room. In years past, Baby boys were dressed in pink, so why the change to the color blue for boys? The answer is a dark one. In just 30 seconds, 30 rounds were fired when the tension between a crew of thieving cowboys and vigilante lawmen came to an explosive head in the frontier town of Tombstone, Arizona. But first, while scientists at SETI are continually monitoring for extraterrestrial contact from the cosmos, ordinary people are already hearing from them – via radio and television. We begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com where you can find the show on Facebook and Twitter, and you can also join the Weird Darkness Weirdos Facebook group. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me 
into the weird darkness. As SETI and other radio astronomers listen for alien broadcasts in the far reaches of outer space, there are plenty of fascinating cases of alleged alien communications being heard right here on planet Earth through ordinary radios and televisions. One of the most famous cases occurred in England on November 26, 1977 on Southern ITV 1977 television which covered London, the South, and Southeast. The time was 5.12 p.m., and the message, audio only, interrupted the evening news. Lasting five and a half minutes, it was superimposed over the voice of the newsreader, Ivor Mills. No less than five transmitters were hijacked simultaneously, spread over great distances, and the Independent Broadcasting Authority was not even aware that the message was overriding their signal, as the transmitters would have been switched off immediately. Possibly this was because the source of the overriding signal was not terrestrial in nature. The message was not totally clear, due to the deep, sonorous sound of the voice as though coming through water, but with sophisticated studio equipment a reasonably positive and accurate copy was made. The biggest point of contention was the name of the voice. Various reports gave it as Vrilon, Gilon, or Glon, but checking it at various speeds it came out more like Brahmaha or Gramaha, the spelling being phonetic. The newsreader appeared completely oblivious to the situation and continued as usual, while the voice spoke slowly and calmly as if echoing through water. This is the transcript. This is the voice of Gramaha, a representative of the Ashtar Galactic Command speaking to you. For many years you have seen us as lights in the skies. We speak to you now in peace and wisdom as we have done to your brothers and sisters all over this, your planet Earth. We come to warn you of the destiny of your race and your world, so that you may communicate to your fellow beings the course you must take to avoid the disasters which threaten your world and the beings on our worlds around you. This is in order that you may share in the Great Awakening as the planet passes into the New Age of Aquarius. The New Age can be a time of great peace and evolution for your race but only if your rulers are made aware of the evil forces that can overshadow their judgments. Be still now and listen, for your chance may not come again. For many years your scientists, government and generals, have not heeded our warnings. They have continued to experiment with the evil forces of what you call nuclear energy. Atomic bombs can destroy the Earth and the beings of your sister worlds in a moment. The wastes from atomic power systems will poison your planet for many thousands of your years to come. We who have followed the path of evolution for far longer than you have long since realized this, that atomic energy is always directed against life. It has no peaceful application. Its use and research into its use must be ceased at once, or you all risk destruction. All weapons of evil must be removed. The time of conflict is now past. The race of which you are a part may proceed to the highest planes of evolution if you show yourselves worthy to do this. You have but a short time to learn to live together in peace and goodwill. Small groups all over the planet are learning this and exist to pass on the light of the dawning new age to you all. You are free to accept or reject their teachings, but only those who learn to live in peace will pass to the higher realms of spiritual evolution. Hear now the voice of Gramaha, a representative of the Ashtar Galactic Command, speaking to you. Be aware also that there are many false prophets and guides operating in your world. They 
will suck your energy from you, the energy you call money, and will put it to evil ends, giving you worthless dross in return. Your inner divine self will protect you from this. You must learn to be sensitive to the voice within that can tell you what is truth and what is confusion, chaos, and untruth. Learn to listen to the voice of truth which is within you, and you will lead yourselves on to the path of evolution. This is our message to our dear friends. We have watched you growing for many years as you too have watched our lights in your skies. You know now that we are here and that there are more beings on and around your earth that your scientists admit. We are deeply concerned about you and your path toward the light and will do all we can to help you. Have no fear, seek only to know yourselves and live in harmony with the ways of your planet Earth. We of the Ashtar Galactic Command thank you for your attention. We are now leaving the plane of your existence. May you be blessed by the supreme love and truth of the cosmos. The message received a mixed reaction. Some listeners were terrified, some intrigued, while others remained skeptical. Of course, the media denounced the broadcast as a hoax, even though the independent broadcasting authority failed to explain how its stringent security system was bypassed. At no time did anyone come forward to claim responsibility for the hoax. This incredible explanation was soon seen to be a cover-up, as investigation by independent sources came to the conclusion that the message would have to have been cut in to at least five transmitters simultaneously. Furthermore, the hoaxers would have had to have beaten the IBA's monitoring system. Engineers at the center around Britain watch for faults in transmission and can, if necessary, switch off sections of the network. Neither the main TV transmitter at Southampton or the engineers at Croydon, Surrey, who were monitoring Hannington, logged the galactic message, and they were clearly unaware that the space broadcast was overriding their signal. By law, all radio and TV has to have a monitoring system for an instant switch-off, technically known as insertion test signals. It did not even register the interruption, suggesting that it was achieved in some way that bypassed the electrical system. According to other stories, it would seem that broadcasts of a similar nature occurred worldwide, even in different areas of the UK. We speak to you now in peace and wisdom as we have done to your brothers and sisters all over this your planet Earth. The Ashtar Galactic Command, as mentioned in the broadcast, features quite prominently in channeled and contactee material going back to the early 1940s. In channelings subsequent to the broadcast, the entities have claimed responsibility. In 1994, at least three independent channelers published information that the Ashtar Command were planning another similar series of broadcasts. However, it appears that proposed dates have, so far, not been met. Another interesting case involved an 18-year-old ham radio operator named Robert P. Renaud. In July 1961, Renaud was trying to pick up BBC Radio on his shortwave set when he picked up a strange beep high in the 25-meter band that overshadowed BBC. When he tuned in on the beep, it stopped and a clear, soft, feminine voice came over the radio saying, Bob, we'd like you to stay on this frequency for a while. The voice claimed to be an extraterrestrial in a spacecraft from a planet called Corindor. The Corendians instructed Renaud how to modify his home-built shortwave radio set to receive their broadcasts better. After a few radio contacts, the Corendians helped Renaud modify his home-built TV set to pick up their images on the Viticon tube while he spoke to them on radio. Those contacts continued and developed into face-to-face -face meetings and even into going on trips with them in their craft for months and years he kept careful notes on his contacts. Investigator Alan Grease visited Renaud in his home and was perplexed by Renaud's attitude. He showed no signs whatsoever of wanting to promote himself, Grease said. There was no showbiz, 
no snake oil, he didn't even seem much interested in talking. He'd answer questions, but he wouldn't offer anything. He was hesitant to entertain visitors, and he sold nothing, made no money. He said the whole business was imposed on him, he hadn't gone after it. Renaud had a large collection of tapes alleged on his space communications. Kreis listened to some of them and heard what was supposed to be the voice of the primary contact woman, Lynn Airy. He recalls, these were good quality reel-to-reel recordings. The woman's voice had a kind of hesitancy in speech patterns, suggesting a foreign person doing well in English. It had a sing-song, melodious quality. There have additionally been isolated instances of alleged contacts having been made through TV and radio. One occurred in England on January 8, 1971, when UFO researcher Rex Dutta was on a radio talk show and invited people to telephone in with questions. What was considered by him to have been a voice from outer space came on, a clear voice that showed no echo or feedback on the engineer's instruments. Even more strange, while Dutta's voice registered on the station's VU meter, the mysterious caller's voice did not. It should be considered that the incidents I've mentioned here could be nothing more than simple hoaxes. However, if our planet is being visited by extraterrestrial races, what better way to initiate contact with a select few than by using our own electronic equipment? It would be interesting to see if there have been any recent reports of alleged extraterrestrial communications using home computers, the internet, and text messaging. On November 19, 1924, Hollywood movie producer Thomas Eintz died after celebrating his 42nd birthday aboard a yacht belonging to infamous newspaper publisher William Randolph Hearst. But to this day, the exact circumstances of his death remain a mystery. Could this be why his ghost still wanders the movie studio that he founded? Thomas Eintz was a pioneering member of the Hollywood elite. In 1918, he founded Culver Studios and was considered to be the father of the Western. He was also the man who introduced the world to Mary Pickford, crowning her America's sweetheart. Eintz rose from being a $15 per week actor to becoming the head of a studio and to this day still has a street named after him in Culver City, Eintz Boulevard. Almost a century later, Culver Studios remains one of Hollywood's most historic studios. It was the site of filming for Gone with the Wind, Citizen Kane, and other classics. Over the years, the film lot has been home to such names as RKO, Howard Hughes, and Desilu Studios. In addition to film classics, Culver Studios was also the birthplace to favorite television shows like The Andy Griffith Show, Lassie, Hogan's Heroes, and Batman. Previous owners of the studio have included Cecil B. DeMille and eccentric billionaire Howard Hughes. But Thomas Eintz had humbled beginnings in the movie capital. In 1915, Eintz partnered with D.W. Griffith and Max Sennett to create the Triangle Motion Picture Company in Culver City. Somewhere along the way, the deal went sour and Eintz sold out and entered into a lease with Harry Culver for a new 14-acre studio fronting on Washington Boulevard. It took two years to build the Thomas H. Eintz Studio, and in December 1918, a Los Angeles newspaper called it a motion picture plant that looks like a beautiful southern estate. Eintz, a visionary in the industry, promoted the glamour of movie making, and he entertained the King and Queen of Belgium and President Woodrow Wilson at the studios. The administration building became a well-known landmark, and Eintz was rapidly expanding his successful facility. Unfortunately, it was not meant to last, and neither was Eintz's revered status. Sadly, Eintz is remembered much more today for his scandalous death than for his contribution to the art of movie making. Eintz died in November 1924 while celebrating his birthday on board a yacht owned by newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst. 
The real story of how Eines died will never be known, but Hollywood rumors tell a strange and twisted tale. Eines's mysterious death will forever be linked to Marion Davies and William Randolph Hearst, the greatest newspaper baron and one of the most powerful men in American history. By the 1920s, Hearst had also become a major film financier. He had first become interested in film through newsreels in 1911, but soon his hobby turned to a quest for profit. It was not long before his zeal for the movies was enhanced due to his passion for furthering the film career of a sweet but untalented film actress, Marion Davies, with whom Hearst had been carrying on a notorious affair. Hearst bought stock in MGM and created Cosmopolitan Productions, a company that specifically produced Marion's films. His newspapers and magazines proclaimed her to be a miracle of the movies, and he did everything he could to entrench her into the Hollywood film colony. Parties thrown at Marion's beach house were the most extravagant in town, and people grabbed at the chance of an invitation to a Hearst affair. In addition, being able to relax at Hearst's vast mansion in San Simeon with millions of dollars worth of imported furnishings, tapestries, paintings, and 35 automobiles in the garage was a must for anyone lucky enough to get an invitation for the weekend. Marion also earned high marks as a hostess, even if privately the party attendees made fun at her attempts at acting on the screen. Another popular party spot was Hearst's 280-foot yacht, the Oneida. Invitations to the boat were even more highly coveted than those for the beach house parties. On the night of Saturday, November 15, 1924, the yacht left San Pedro Harbor for a weekend cruise to San Diego. The cream of Hollywood's charmed circle received invitations to a party on board the Oneida that weekend. There were a number of guests on board, but the only names that became available after the party were Hearst, Marion Davies, actress Cena Owen, and author Eleanor Glenn. That weekend marked the 43rd birthday of Thomas Eintz, who was in the midst of negotiations with Hearst concerning the use of his Culver City Studios as a base for Cosmopolitan Productions. It had been planned to throw Eintz a birthday party on board the yacht. Mrs. Eintz, who had also been invited, decided not to go along on the trip because she was not feeling well. Eintz, the guest of honor, missed the boat when it sailed from San Pedro because of his attendance at the premiere of The Mirage, his latest film. It is believed that he took the last train to San Diego, where he met the Oneida and joined the party for the return trip. The celebration on board was said to be a wonderful occasion. But then things got murky. In the early morning hours of the following Wednesday, Thomas Eintz died at his Benedict Canyon home. His death was attributed to heart failure. When the news reached the press, all sorts of ugly rumors began to circulate, as well as a hash of conflicting stories. Things became so heated that Chester Kempley, the district attorney in San Diego where the yacht had been anchored for the weekend, was forced to open an investigation. The principals were all strangely absent at the hearings that followed. Hearst could not be reached for a statement. Marion, Eleanor Glynn, and Cena Owen, the only names known for certain to have been on board, were not called by the DA to give testimony. The only person present at the hearing in San Diego was a doctor named Goodman, an employee of Hearst. His official version of events, which was printed in Hearst newspapers, stated that after eating and drinking too much at the party, Eins died of acute indigestion. He was taken from the yacht and rushed home where he later died. After the hearing, the case was closed. Originally, D.A. Kempley had insisted that he planned to call every single person who had been on board the yacht to give their version of events, but not only did he not call any of them, he suddenly, after just the one session, called off all further inquiry altogether. He was satisfied that Eins's death had been explained, but others were not satisfied, including a number of newspaper columnists and writers of the day, who demanded that the authorities look into Eins's suspicious death. 
One of the strangest facts about the cruise was that no accurate list of the guests on board the ship that weekend has ever been revealed. There were obviously many more people on board than have ever been reported. Several well-known personalities of the film world have been mentioned as Hearst's guests that weekend, but none of them ever publicly admitted to being on board the yacht. Of course, there were many rumors about who was there, just what actually occurred, and what really happened to cause the death of Thomas Eintz. Perhaps the most exciting rumor to make the rounds in Hollywood involved the presence of Eintz's friend Charlie Chaplin on board the Oneida for the party. Rumor had it, however, that Chaplin had not been invited just because he was Eintz's pal. Harst was insanely jealous of other men's attention to Marion Davies, and his detectives had recently informed him that Marion and Chaplin had been seen together during a period of time when he was out of town. Hearst allegedly invited the comedic actor on board the yacht for the weekend cruise so that he could observe for himself how Chaplin and Marion behaved around one another. It is believed that Hearst saw Marion and Chaplin slip off together during the party and that he discovered them together on the lower deck. A loud altercation followed and Hearst ran for his cabin to retrieve a diamond-studded revolver that he kept on board. Hearst was rumored to be an expert shot and often amused his guests on the boat by shooting down seagulls with a single bullet. In the confusion that followed, it was rumored a shot was fired, but it was Thomas Eintz, not Chaplin, who ended up with a bullet in the head. Eintz's funeral was held November 21st, attended by his family, Marion Davies, Chaplin, Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, and Harold Lloyd. Hearst was noticeably absent. The body was immediately cremated, and an official inquest was never held. Despite the fact that the evidence was now in ashes, Hearst knew he could be in trouble with the Hollywood rumor mill. Everyone on board the Oneida was sworn to secrecy, and it wouldn't be wise to cross Hearst. But in spite of this, persistent rumors linked Hearst to Eintz's death. No one could resist talking about the way the hearings into Eintz's death had been called off, the lack of an official inquest, or the damning story that Charlie Chaplin's secretary had seen Eintz carried off the yacht bleeding from a bullet wound to the head. Some thought it no coincidence that famed gossip columnist Luella Parsons was awarded a lifetime contract with Hearst soon after the incident, since it was rumored that she had seen everything that had happened. Luella also felt the need to do a little covering up of her own, and insisted that she'd been in New York at the time of Vince's death. The only problem with this story was that Vera Burnett, Marion's stand-in, clearly recalled seeing Luella with Marion and Davies at the studio, ready for departure on the yacht. Vera valued her job, though, and decided not to make a big deal out of it. Marion and Hearst managed to ride out the scandal unscathed, but as D.W. Griffith remarked in later years, all you have to do to make Hearst turn white as a ghost is mention Eintz's name. There's plenty wrong there, but Hearst is too big to touch. It was widely known in Hollywood that if you ever wanted to attend another party at Marion's Beach House or the San Simeon Castle, you didn't mention Eintz's name any place where Hearst might hear you. In the years that followed, Hearst discreetly provided Eintz's widow, Nell, with a trust fund that was later wiped out by the Depression. Broke and penniless, Nell finished out her days as a taxi driver. As for Hearst, the entire affair was eventually reduced to a sardonic joke in Hollywood as the Oneida became known as William Randolph's Hearst. Strangely, though, death did not bring an end to sightings of Thomas Eintz, and his mysterious death also started rumors about Culver Studios being haunted. Eintz built the studios, but they managed to change hands several times after his death. Cecil B. DeMille, Howard Hughes, David Selznick, Desi Arnaz, and Lucille Ball made significant contributions to film and television history on this lot. The rumors of the haunting have persisted for years. Employees have reported ghostly figures roaming the lot at night, 
while others recount being frightened by the apparition of a woman who appears on the third floor from time to time. She always disappears quickly, leaving a cold spot of chilling wind behind. Most famous, however, are the sightings of Thomas Eintz himself. Witnesses have reported seeing the ghost of a man climbing the stairs in the main administration building, heading for the executive screening room. This had been Eintz's private projection room during his tenure at the studio. Remodeling seemed to bring out the worst in Eintz's ghost in 1988 when he began to reveal his displeasure over some major renovations. The first to encounter him were two workmen who looked up to see a man in an odd, bowler-type hat watching them from the catwalks above stage 123. When they spoke to him, he frowned and then turned and walked into the second-floor wall. Later that summer, special effects man Eugene Hilchey spoke to another worker who had also seen a man wearing an odd hat, this time on stage 234. Hilchey was convinced the man's description matched that of Eintz. The worker's statement was enough to cement his belief. The ghost had reportedly turned to the workmen and said, I don't like what you're doing to my studio. Then he vanished into the wall. Even after the renovations, much of Eintz's original studio remains as it was, and the sense of history here is very strong. Today, Culver Studios remains one of the busiest lots in town. Hopefully, Thomas Eintz's spirit can find a little peace in that. Up next, a family moves into a new home, and it's not long before they begin hearing strange sounds coming from the home bar in their living room. And in years past, baby boys were dressed in pink. So why the change to the color blue for boys? The answer is a dark one. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. Our next Weirdo Watch Party is Saturday, April 13th. Are all the men gathered? All the fools. We'll be treated to a Roger Corman crap fest from 1958, Teenage Caveman, starring Robert Vaughn. There are shadows there, deep and cold, and dirt that eats men. Did he just say dirt that eats men? There are shadows there, deep and cold, and dirt that eats men. Yep, I guess so. Mistress Malicious and her Mistress Peace Theater will keep us entertained throughout the film as we watch this caveman teenager with great hair go into the jungle to fight prehistoric monsters like, um, dogs and, and uh, an armadillo. Whatever. They're prehistoric creatures. An animal's far more terrible than any you've seen. Our Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch online, so grab your popcorn, candy, and soda and jump into the fun and even get involved in the live chat as we watch the movie. We could make a place to lie down on. Plus, during this Weirdo Watch Party, I'll be giving away a creepy crate to one lucky winner full of scary surprises like horror collectibles, true crime-themed accessories, books, terrifying trinkets, and more with some Weird Darkness swag added in. You won't know what's in the creepy crate until you open it. Strengthening his courage, his daring, his dreams. And I'll be giving instructions on how to win the creepy crate inside the chat during the movie, so you have to tune in to win. It's Teenage Caveman, Saturday, April 13th, hosted by Mistress Peace Theater. See the awe-inspiring beasts in a teenage caveman's world. The show begins at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Mountain, and 7 p.m. Pacific. You can watch a trailer for the film and watch horror hosts and schlocky B-movies anytime, day or night, on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. Hope to see you on Saturday, April 13th. My parents moved into their house in Mexico about 20 years ago. My mother made the move by herself. My father stayed behind in Seattle, tying up some loose ends. I agreed to help my mom move and stay with her until my dad joined her, which was to happen in a span of about two to three months. My mom and I got to the house a day before the moving company was scheduled to arrive with all the furniture. 
that gave my mom enough time to hire some much-needed help. And that was the day we met Letty, who became my mom's housekeeper for the following eight years. She was a godsend. She was hardworking, loyal, and knew just about everyone in the neighborhood. Letty helped us hire some men that helped us move all the heavy furniture while we unpacked all the boxes. It took the three of us about a week of hard work to get everything put away, but finally we were sitting in the living room, exhausted but basking in the glory of our accomplishment, when we started hearing noises coming from a home bar we had in the living room. This was a wooden bar, like you see in taverns. It had three stools, wine bottle racks, shelves for wine glasses and stemware, and had drawers in the back for cocktail utensils, as well as a storage cabinet where we kept things like a blender, ice bucket, martini shakers, etc. Like I mentioned, everything was put away and in order. The first thing we thought was that maybe a rat had got in. We hadn't seen any evidence of rodents, but at the time it was the only thing that made sense. Letty got up and was heading towards the bar when suddenly we heard growling coming from the storage cabinet. The wine glasses started shaking and clinking. The cabinet doors started slamming. It literally sounded like two wild animals were fighting in there. I was so terrified I couldn't even get up and run. I stayed there with my heart pounding, listening to my mother pray and scream. Then, just as suddenly as it started, it stopped. We were too scared to check. Letty, being the brave one, grabbed a broom and opened both cabinet and drawer doors. Nothing came out. No animals. Nothing. Everything was untouched. We got out of the house and headed for the nearest church. Letty knew the priest and was able to get him to go back with us to bless the house. My mom and I slept in the same room for a few nights after that, too scared to be by ourselves. A few weeks later, my mom and Letty were digging in the front yard, working on a flower bed when they came upon some jars. When they pulled them out, there was little rag dolls that had pins stuck to them and other things that they couldn't make out. They did not open the jars. Letty said that she knew somebody who would know how to dispose of them, so she took them with her. The place where they were digging is directly on the other side of the wall where the bar is. I don't know if this finding had anything to do with the incident a few weeks before, but it is a big coincidence that the noises were coming so close to where these weird objects were found. Everything was quiet for a while, nothing out of the ordinary. Then we hosted a party one day. I think it was a housewarming. There were only a few guests left, mostly family. It was around 3 a.m. Some people were sitting on the bar stools. Others were standing around the bar talking and drinking when suddenly a mirror with the word bar that was hanging on the wall shattered. It didn't just crack, it shattered. Well, that was an immediate party pooper because everyone cleared out of there real fast. One other time, my mother was walking around at night before bed securing doors and windows. She had just made it back to her bedroom when she swears she heard glass breaking. She thought that all the wine and liquor bottles had fallen and shattered, but when she went to check, everything was in order. No broken glass. Upon inspecting, she noticed one of the windows next to the bar was open. This didn't scare her too much because there are bars on that window, so there's no way somebody could have gotten in, even with the window open, but she swears she had checked that window a few minutes before and it was closed. She thought maybe Somebody had thrown a rock and shattered the glass, but there was no broken glass anywhere. She checked. The window wasn't broken. It was open, meaning somebody had to slide it to open it. She says that it is possible she missed seeing the window open, but what was the loud noise she heard, like dishes breaking? When she shared this with the family, we told her that maybe the noise was coming from the outside, and with the window open, it sounded close. She's very adamant, though, that the noise came from inside. Another incident involving this home bar, I was randomly taking pictures of the house when I noticed something very strange was showing in a picture of the bar. One of the stools had a scary image. It looks like a devil with horns. I showed this to my family and they were all freaked out. My mom insisted that I delete the image from my camera. I never did. 
Problem is, I can't find the camera. I only take pictures with my phone now, but I'm searching and I will upload that photo if I ever find it. The image is very clear. No distortion. You can see it without anybody telling you what to look for. What I do have is a lot of pictures of family and friends sitting at the bar, and on a few of them you can see orbs. I don't want to share those because of privacy, because orbs can mean just about anything. I've tried taking pictures of the bar with my phone and I don't get anything anymore. The house has been quiet lately. I've done a lot of cleansings and blessings, and it'll stay quiet for a while, and then suddenly for some unknown reason it wakes up again. By the way, I'll submit a story about Letty at a later time. She turned out to be a bruja, or witch. She showed me a lot of things that I can't explain, and I'd like to know what others think. The colors pink and blue have been used as gender signifiers for quite some time now. We're so used today that baby boys are dressed in blue, we rarely think about why this color was chosen for newborn males. We also tend to forget that not so long ago, boys were dressed in pink. Some modern parents who dislike stereotypes disregard this unwritten rule and dress their kids in any color they want, but many do try to follow the old customs of blue and pink. As a matter of fact, just before the 1920s, pink was considered the best color for boys. According to a June 1918 article from the trade publication Earnshaw's Infants Department, the generally acceptable rule is pink for the boys and blue for the girls. The reason is that pink, being a more decided and stronger color, is more suitable for the boy, while blue, which is more delicate and dainty, is prettier for the girl. This changed later, of course, and people started dressing their baby boys in blue, something our ancestors did thousands of years ago. In ancient Egypt and Greece, blue was used to protect a person or a place from evil spirits. Pharaohs were often dressed in blue. Egyptians and many other civilizations considered blue the color of divine origin. It's therefore not surprising that the color blue was specifically chosen by our ancestors who wanted to protect their newborn from evil spirits that might be lurking about. This ancient tradition is still alive, and there are many places in the Mideast where people still paint their doorways to ward off evil spirits. In his book, Ever Wonder Why, Douglas B. Smith wrote, Centuries ago it was commonly believed that satanic spirits hovered about nurseries waiting for a chance to enter the bodies of young children. It was also believed that these evil spirits could be repelled by the color blue, the color of the heavens. To many of us, it may seem odd that newborn girls were not dressed in blue too then, but back then baby boys were more precious than baby girls. Parents considered girls to be inferior and was assumed that evil spirits wouldn't even bother with them. Ancient people could dress baby girls in any color, but small boys had to be dressed in blue so they could be protected from these harmful, evil powers. Today there are still many people who fear the evil eye, a harmful power that comes from emotions such as envy or greed. In many countries, one can easily buy various amulets that shield its bearer from the curse of the evil eye. One of the most famous symbols protecting against the evil eye is called Hamza, a universal symbol that is especially popular among Jews and Muslims. Nazar amulets that also offer protection against the evil eye are especially popular in Turkey, but they can be found in other countries as well. In Macedonia, Albania, Bosnia, and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Greece, Cyprus, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Egypt, Armenia, Iran, India, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, and Azerbaijan, Nazar is often hung in homes, offices, cars, children's clothing, or incorporated in jewelry and ornaments. And yes, it's the color blue. The blue color in these protective amulets is still of special importance because it is widely regarded to ward off evil powers.
when Weird Darkness returns. In just 30 seconds, 30 rounds were fired when the tension between a crew of thieving cowboys and vigilante lawmen came to an explosive head in the frontier town of Tombstone, Arizona. The true story behind the gunfight at the OK Corral is up next. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. The OK Corral shootout has become an iconic footnote in the history of the Wild West. Lawman Wyatt Earp, his brothers James and Virgil, and his faithful friend Doc Holliday faced off against a team of lawless cowboys who ran ragged through the frontier town of Tombstone, Arizona. It is a classic tale of cops and robbers of the Wild West. But movies and certain history texts have romanticized the 30-second shootout and perpetuated false facts. For one thing, some continue to debate whether the Earp brothers were truly noble lawmen who sought to tame the Wild West or merely brutal vigilantes who committed a small-town massacre. But the thin line between hero and criminal was exactly the atmosphere in which the Wild West was centered. The small historic town of Tombstone was founded by Ed Scheifelin in 1877, who was determined to prospect on Apache land despite warnings that all you'll find out there is your tombstone. Instead, Scheifelin found a silver mine that eventually produced over $37 million in profits. Wealthy merchants in the hopes of cashing in on the mine soon set up shop in Tombstone. The town was soon aglow with fine dining restaurants opera houses, and a bowling alley. The OK Corral was one of eight liveries in the small town. Indeed, the streets of Tombstone were flooded with cash, but they were also absent a lawman to maintain order. The bustling frontier town attracted a dangerous crowd and became an easy target for rustlers and bandits. Tombstone was soon overrun with gambling houses, brothels, and violence. In December 1879, the brothers James, Virgil, and Wyatt Earp, along with a gunslinging ex-dentist named Doc Holliday, rolled into town to administer their own brand of justice. Wyatt Earp was an ex-lawman of his hometown in Missouri. When his wife died, Earp wandered the West and got himself into some legal trouble. He eventually settled in Dodge City, Kansas, where he became the city marshal. In 1879, he set off with a new friend he'd made in Kansas, Doc Holliday, to Tombstone with his brothers. Despite what we think of the word today, in the old American Southwest, cowboy referred to an outlaw or a member of a gang of hard-drinking cattle smugglers and horse thieves. In Tombstone, that crew was known as the Cochise County Cowboys. The Cochise County Cowboys went from being a nuisance to the Earp brothers' mortal enemies when one of their members accidentally killed the city marshal, Fred White, October 28, 1880. Fred White and Wyatt Earp had been summoned to calm down a few drunk cowboys unloading their pistols into the night sky. White asked the men to surrender their weapons, and they complied, but a gun belonging to Curly Bill Brocious accidentally went off and shot White in the gut. It was an accident, even Fred White would insist as much while lying on his deathbed 
as did Wyatt Earp, who defended Brocious on trial. But the death of Fred White saw Virgil Earp named the new city marshal in his stead, and with that, a new era came to Tombstone. Under Virgil, it was illegal to carry any weapon within the town's limits, a law that gave the Earp brothers just cause to arrest about any cowboy they saw. Meanwhile, the county sheriff, John Behan, did little to bring thieving cowboys to justice. This angered the Earps, especially Wyatt, whose hopes to become county sheriff were dashed when Behan took the position. Wyatt Earp reasoned that he could gain some good publicity and a better shot at winning county sheriff if he could prove himself. He struck a deal with a rancher named Ike Clanton, who was close with the cowboys, to bring the thieves to justice. In return for his cooperation, Earp promised Clanton a $6,000 reward. The deal did not last long, and when it dissolved, Earp was again left in the lurch. On October 25, 1881, the day before the gunfight at the OK Corral, Doc Holliday confronted Clanton in a saloon. The men fought viciously, and later that day, Clanton tracked down Wyatt Earp and threatened him. Around noon the next day, Virgil and Morgan Earp found Ike Clanton, who was drunk and yelling that he was looking to fight, and put him under arrest for carrying a weapon. Clanton, by most accounts, went willingly, after Virgil disarmed him with a pistol whipping. On his way out of the courthouse, Wyatt bumped into another cowboy, Frank McClory, and, finding he was carrying a gun, pistol whipped him twice in the head and left him bloody on the ground. Around 3 p.m., the Earp brothers, along with Doc Holliday, spotted five cowboys loading up guns. Ike Clanton and Frank McClory were part of the group, along with Billy Claiborne, Tom McClory, and Clanton's 19-year-old brother, Billy. The cowboys then went off to plot revenge behind the OK Corral. Next, in a narrow, empty lot beside Fly's photograph gallery above the corral, the Earps, with Holiday, came upon the cowboys. Virgil Earp yelled toward the cowboys, "'Throw up your hands! I have come to disarm you!' What transpired next remains a mystery. Both sides claimed the opposing group fired first. No matter, Frank McClory's belly was shot and the man collapsed. Virgil then shot young Billy, who, even as he lay on the ground bleeding to death, kept shooting. Doc Holliday's shotgun made short work of Tom McClory and blasted through his chest. Ike Clanton and Tom McClory were the only cowboys who came out of the fight alive, and that was because they ran for their lives. Thirty rounds were fired in a matter of thirty seconds behind the OK Corral. The Earps came out with a few scratches, but three cowboys were dead. Many took sides with the deceased cowboys. When their funeral procession went through the town, more than 300 people came out to watch. Mourners packed close to four city blocks. The funeral was, as one of the local papers noted, the largest ever witnessed in Tombstone. After weeks of testimony and witness accounts, Judge Wells Spicer ruled that the gunfight at the OK Corral had not been a few lawmen keeping order, but rather an act of violence by men with a vendetta. The Earps and Holiday were spared only because of the nature of the Wild West. When we consider the conditions of affairs incident to a frontier country, the lawlessness and disregard for human life, the judge went on during his ruling on the shootout at the OK Corral, I can attach no criminality to this unwise act. I order them to be released. Whether Judge Spicer was right or wrong remains in debate today, but the gunfight at the OK Corral was not to be forgotten. It was just the start of what would be one of the most brutal chapters in the history of the American frontier. Shortly after the verdict of the trial of the OK Corral gunfight, a cowboy fired a shotgun through the glass door of a saloon and into Virgil Earp's back. Virgil survived, but his brother Morgan was later not so lucky. In the midst of a game of pool, the Earp brother was fatally shot in the back in a second assassination plot thought to be orchestrated by none other than Ike Clanton. Wyatt Earp responded with a rampage of his own which ended in a warrant for his and Holiday's arrest. The two fled Tombstone, and Earp would spend the remainder of his days wandering the West, 
eventually settling in California, where he died at the age of 80 in 1929. The gunfight at the OK Corral remains an infamous moment in American history. The event perfectly represented the gray area of justice that was a part of the Wild West as the shootout was both divisive and controversial with no real winner on either side. The true heroes of the OK Corral shootout remain ambiguous, as was the nature of the lawless West. But thanks in part to films such as Gunfight at the OK Corral and Tombstone, the Earps and Doc Holliday remain the protagonists of the tale. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. And you can find the show on Facebook and Twitter, including the show's Weirdos Facebook group, on the contact social page at WeirdDarkness.com. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, click on Tell Your Story. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Alien Voices over radio and television was posted at The Conspiracy Journal. The Mysterious Death of Thomas Ice is by Troy Taylor. Something in that part of the house is by Haven. Baby Blues was written by Connie Waters. And the true story behind the gunfight at the OK Corral was written by Mark Oliver. Again, you can find links to all of these stories in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Romans 6, verses 11 and 12. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. In a final thought, you'll be free the moment you no longer care what other people think about you. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness. Hey Weirdos! Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.